Okay. So we, so this, uh, so earlier we were discussing about the, the standard model EFT. And we said there are uh, really many different uh, operators up to dimension six, uh, especially if you include flavor indices. So the particular case of this uh, dimension five operator, uh, one has 12 parameters. Um, and in the particular case of this uh, B violating operator, uh, adding flavor, this uh, turns into 162 different operators. So as you can see, this complicates the, the theory uh, quite a lot. Uh, in general, this is uh, the form uh, of the Smith Lagrangian. So the standard model Lagrangian, dimension five operators, dimension six operators, et cetera. And each of these uh, coefficients in front of the operators contain uh, the corresponding suppression with the scale that gives the, the appropriate uh, mass dimension, okay? Uh, so the, renormali uh, the renormalizable standard model, of course, uh, has uh, zero values for all these coefficients. So you, you may think of the standard model, so the renormalizable standard model as a particular uh, uh, new physics model that gives zero for all the matching conditions for all these uh, effective operators. Um, so to, in order to probe this idea of removing this axiom of renormalizability, we would like to measure some non-zero values for these coefficients. And it's obviously going to be more and more difficult to find non-zero coefficients uh, down the line, the expansion, because we expect, for example, these dimension five terms to be the most relevant. And it turns out we already have some evidence for this uh, dimension five uh, coefficients because the only dimension five operator in the SMEF, uh, the, which is this Weinberg operator with two leptons and two Higgs fields, um, this leads to a Majorana mass for the, for the neutrino. Okay, the neutrinos are massless in the standard model because they violate an accidental symmetry, okay? But once you include this uh, dimension five operator and you break the electroweak symmetry, then it's easy to see that you get something like this. And this is just a Majorana mass, okay? You can see this also in this way. You have an operator with two neutrinos and two Higgs fields. And when you give the vacuum expectation value to the two Higgs fields, you get you get something that looks like a, like a Majorana mass for the neutrino. And the size of this mass is something like this. Of course, it's proportional to the VEF square of the Higgs. It has a one over lambda scaling because the, the, the operator is dimension five. And then there is the, the coefficient of the operator that in general you expect to be of order one, but of course that could be uh, further suppression mechanisms. With some assumptions, uh, because we know the scale of the neutrino masses, one arrives to the conclusion that this mass scale associated to this dimension five operator is of the order of 10 to the 14 GeV, which is quite large. And this also explains why uh, this has taken so long and it's difficult to see in other places. So as I said, this operator breaks lepton number, which is an accidental symmetry of the standard model. And this is precisely the reason why, although the scale is so high, it was possible to, to detect it, right? Because, because you're looking for processes that are forbidden in the standard model. And then uh, if you see something, then this is an indication of, of the presence of this. Let me continue. Um, so I was talking about the breaking of accidental symmetries, which is a very important subject. And this is why uh, we can detect this uh, first uh, dimension five operator. Um, so as I said, this is important because uh, the breaking of accidental symmetries are, are null tests of the standard model. 
Another important example is a bio number violation. Uh, so bio number is uh, also an accidental symmetry. Uh, and then one can look for observables that break this, this accidental symmetry. The, the most famous one is proton decay. Uh, and proton decay can be mediated by, by, by this operator, for example, uh, that we found before, okay? Because as you can see, it's an operator with three quarks and one lepton. And in fact, uh, you can draw a diagram that looks like this, which is a diagram that will mediate uh, the decay proton into pion electron, okay? Of course, we have searched for this, uh, but we have found no proton decay, but there is a, a lower bound on the lifetime of the proton, which is about 10 to the 30 years. And this leads to a, a bound on the scale associated to this operator of about 10 to the 15 GeV, which is also pretty high. Uh, so, this, so actually, this... Javier, I, I have a question here. Sure. In, mm -hmm. in, in, in all of these, uh in all the effective field theories we have this mass scale but you, you're always so always assuming something about the coupling strength right when sure, you're yes mm -hmm. so i i don't know if you mentioned that this morning but could you just remind us of what you what's assumed normally for the couplings for each of these new operators yes so so as you can see uh here for example that they say that the neutrino mass is uh, goes so it has this uh this form Okay, um, this C here is just the, the coefficient of the, of, of the operator, uh, okay? okay? And then uh, if, I want to, if I want to say something about the scale, I have to know something about, the, about this, uh, this C here. Now, if the, if the power counting is fine and the scalings are fine and everything is normal, then you expect this to be of order one. Uh, if this is generated by some weakly coupled uh, theory, then maybe this is proportional to some couplings or something like this. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I'm talking about the assumptions here. Um, okay. You can never really say what the scale is. You can only say what this, what the combination of the scale mm -hmm. with the couplings is. Um, okay. oh. Sometimes this is called effective scale. Uh, and of course, if the if the if this coefficient here is is uh, is small, then uh, the 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 scale can be can be can be lower. Okay. Um, we, I, I will show you some more specific examples of 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 how uh, at the end the, the the scalings end up working well anyway. So okay. But yes, typically right. when we talk about the scale, we talk about the effective scale, meaning that the coefficient is, is, is of the right order. Uh, there is no uh, funny cancellations or, 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 or it's not like uh, enhanced for any, for any reason, which could be, but uh, that, that you can only know if you go to the details of a specific model. Uh, thanks, thanks, Ari. Okay, so as I said, this this scale lambda it doesn't have to be the same one. So the lambda that is associated with the variant number uh, violating operator doesn't need to be the same as the lambda that is related to the neutrino masses. Okay, so the fact that these numbers are are different, so the fact that this is ten to the fourteen, but this is larger than ten to the fifteen, shouldn't shouldn't worry. Okay. Now the cutoff scale is some scale related to some physics at high energy. And I've been talking about effective theories, but, but uh, as I said, um, this, this, uh, this uh, higher dimensional operators in the SMEF, one typically understands this as coming from um, the matching conditions or, or the, the, the generated at some high energy scale lambda from some BSM physics, okay? So you have some model, you have some, some heavy particles uh, that give this extra term in the, in the Lagrangian, okay? So this would be the standard model. And then up here, you have some heavy particles, you will have some extra pieces in the Lagrangian. And then when you go 
when you go down and you do experiments at the electric scale, um, then uh, the effect of these particles, uh, you can only see them uh, in the form of uh, local interactions of, dimension, of higher dimensional operators. They also renormalize the standard model parameters, but you can never see that, of course, because, because you have to renormalize, okay? Um, so, so, uh, so, so you don't you don't see this effect, but it's there. Where you can see the effect is in, in the in the coefficients of the higher dimensional operator. So this is a this picture here is a, a very typical picture, which is very very useful because uh, it tells you more or less what's going on. You have a we have a BSM model up here, and then when you go uh, down to the electric scale, these uh, heavy particles are integrated out in the form of a local higher dimensional operators. And then if you go down to the scale of QCD or to the, to the scale of low energy experiments much below the electric scale, you will have a, a, a similar process in which you integrate out the electric bosons and, and so on. And you will uh, start building a, a, a tower of effective theories uh, with uh, fewer and fewer uh, dynamic degrees of freedom. I will, I will discuss this in chapter four. Uh, for the moment, I will I will keep, uh, keep talking about this uh, SMEF at the electric scale. An example of how this uh, this uh, uh, generation of local operators happens, you can think of, for example, a heavy scalar, okay, which is coupled to some standard model fermions in some way, okay, and then if you look for uh, if you look for a, a, a scattering of standard model fermions at the electric scale, for example, <clears throat> then you would calculate this amplitude using such a diagram. And this will give you something like uh, uh, this spinner times this coupling times this spinner, you find it here. And then this spinner times this coupling times this spinner, which gives you this. And then the propagator of the phi, which looks like this. Okay. And T here is the Mandelstam variable. So T is equal to. Uh, p minus p prime square. Okay. Now, if p and p prime are, are of order of the electric scale or lower, uh, or lower, and the, and and it's a scale which is much much smaller than the mass of the of this heavy particle, then you can take this propagator and you can expand it in this way. Okay. You expand it in t over m phi square. Okay. And so, since t is of the order of the electric scale and m phi is of order lambda and electroweak over lambda is very small, this expansion makes sense, okay? And so, um, as you can see, the leading order term in this expansion just gives you g square over m phi square times the product of these two uh, currents, okay? And the product of these two currents is exactly the same you get uh, if, you, if you have a... a, for, a, a, a a four fermion operator such as this one. However, you have to include now this uh, prefactor, which comes from the from the phi propagator. Okay, and this has exactly the right scaling. This has the scaling of a coefficient divided by scale square because this is a dimension six operator. So you can see in a very, very simple uh, example how uh, from a model which has a dynamical uh, heavy scalar, you end up. Uh, writing a, a, a correction of higher dimension, uh, so of dimension higher than four in this particular case, dimension six, uh, added to the to 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 a theory which has no dynamical scalars, heavy scalars, but only has standard model fields. Okay, so in this particular case, the coefficient, or the Wilson coefficient, is given by this uh, factor here, and the operator is just this operator which is built only from uh, light fields in the sense of, uh, stand of fields that are dynamical at the electric scale in this case, okay? This operator only de depends on, uh, on infrared scales, so only depends on operate on, on, on fields that are light. And this coefficient only depends on uh, scales that are related to the, to the BSM scale, so to lambda, okay? As you can see here, this is some coefficient divided by lambda square, where lambda is M phi square. Okay. Um, if you understand this, you understand everything because uh, the only difference uh, with the general case is that in general, 
these calculations are very complicated, but but the, the idea is essentially the same. Okay, so the Wilson coefficients are just some couplings that can be calculated if we know the the UV model. Okay, and in chapter six, if we if we get there, I will be able to teach you some more complicated uh, matching calculations. In chapter five, we will also do some some matchings, but three level. Now, uh, this theory, the SMEF, which uh, contains the standard model and, and higher dimensional operators, of course, is a quantum field theory. It has to be renormalized, okay, at a given order in the in the power expansion, okay. And then these Welsh coefficients have to be um, uh, added. So one has to add counter terms and so on. This is exactly as in QED or in the standard model, okay. So one. Uh, calculates what is called the, the, the beta function sometimes or the anomalous dimensions. It's the same thing, which are uh, given by this expression here. Okay, so when you calculate this uh, these coefficients, uh, typically if you are if you are if you are calculating this by looking at the process at the di diagram that is divergent, then you have to renormalize. You include the counter term, and then the final answer for your Wilson coefficient depends on a renormalization scale mu, and how this renormalization scale mu, so what is the dependence of the coefficient with respect to this mu? It's given by this derivative with respect to the log. And this is what is defined as a beta function. And this beta function depends on the couplings, of course, because you're doing some loops, but also depends on all these uh, Wilson coefficients of dimension six operators, okay? Typically, if you're renormalizing a, a four, dimension four couplings, the beta function can only depend on dimension four couplings. If you're renormalizing dimension five couplings, you can have also coefficients of dimension five operators. If you're renormalizing a, a, a Wilson coefficient of dimension six, then the beta function can depend on Wilson coefficients of dimension six, dimension five, and dimension four, and so on. But you can never have uh, the beta function depending on higher dimensional uh, coefficients because uh, then you wouldn't get the right scaling for the for the Wilson coefficient, and this is good because otherwise you wouldn't be able to to renormalize. Okay, this also leads to something very important called operator mixing, which uh, tells you that if you at one particular scale you have only a contribution to one operator, typically when you calculate the coefficients at a different scale, then immediately you generate a, a bunch of other operators that uh, were not present originally. And this is also why it's important when you write an effective theory to write all the possible operators uh, uh, that are consistent with gauge invariance and with the symmetries of the theory. And this is also uh, the reason why uh, the SMEFT only exists uh, since uh, 10 years ago or something like this. Everyone was using effective theories of the standard model. However, uh, only 12 years ago, someone sat down and tried to uh, consistently build a, a, a set, of, a complete set of, of, of dimension six operators. Okay. Um, and this is what you can find in, in a paper that they will give you the reference later. This one here. Okay. This is the original paper with the basis of, of, uh, of uh, 63 operators. Um, if you want to know or you want to, to find all these beta functions up to dimension six, you can go and look for these papers of, of Manohar and you will find all the information there. Uh, just to finish with this chapter, um, let me show you a few tables. So this is the list of uh, dimension five and dimension six operators in the SMEF divided in different classes. So this is uh, operators with six Higgses, operators with four Higgses and two derivatives, operators with, uh, here you have two fermions and three Higgses, and so on, okay? Four fermion operators of different chiralities. And here you have the number of operators, this sum up to 63, but then of course you have to multiply with all the flavor indices. This just indicates that this breaks lepton number by, uh, by two. And these uh, operators uh, break the baryon number, and these ones here do not break any of these two. Um, so this table is taken from this from this reference. 
Okay, and here uh, you will have the notes. So, so I just wanted you to have these these tables in case you want to use them, uh, maybe to solve some of the exercises and so on. Okay, but here you have the full set of of dimension six operators in this method. Okay. Any questions so far? Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, when we are truncating the uh, series of the propagator up to some order of uh, momentum over the mass of the particle, so uh, how to estimate the error that we are making there? Mm -hmm. There is no way to estimate the error you are making there. Um, however, um, I can tell you that uh, if the scales are widely separated, the error is going to be very small. Uh, so if you, for example, you're considering, ah, well, I can tell you a way of estimating the error, but let me first <laughs> tell you that uh, if, you, if you're considering a model at 10 TeV, um, then, and then you're doing experiments at the electroweak scale. Then the difference between 100 GV and 10 TeV is uh, 100. So E over lambda is 100. If you are including operators of dimension six, you are taking into account corrections of order one over 100 squared. So 10 to the minus four. If you are now wondering whether you should include operators of dimension eight, these operators of dimension eight will give corrections of order one over 100 to the power of four, which is 10 to the minus eight. So it's a, it's a relative uh, size of 10 to the minus four uh, compared to the dimension six uh, contributions that we are including. So for, for practical purposes, this is, uh, even if you have an enhanced Wilson coefficient, uh, this is of course, uh, unless there is an effect which you cannot produce at dimension six, uh, so some accidental symmetry. Uh, there is no accidental symmetry at dimension six, so uh, you are safe with that. Now, there is another thing you can do, is when you're calculating an observable with dimension six operators, you can include the, the interference terms between two dimension six, and this is a dimension eight effect. This in principle is inconsistent because you would, if you, if you want to include this, 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 this uh, in particular, this contribution could be, I mean, you, you should include also direct contributions with two insertions of dimension six operators, but then you have to renormalize, you have to include operators of dimension eight, et cetera, et cetera. But if you calculate an amplitude up to uh, dimension six, um, let me write it here. So you have an amplitude, and this is our standard model plus I of dimension six. Okay, then uh, if you calculate uh, an observable, which will be A squared, you will have uh, A standard model squared, which will be the leading term, plus an interference term A standard model A dimension six, which is of the dimension you are interested in, and then A six squared, okay? But, and this, you know how much it is. Although you shouldn't include it because this is of the same order as, as A standard model times A dimension eight and you're not including dimension eight. However, you can calculate this, which you know what it is. You see what is the size. And this should in principle be an estimate of uh, the dimension eight uh, contribution, okay? Sometimes this is done uh, just as an estimate, but uh, in most cases, this is not even needed. Did I answer the question? Okay, right. and uh, so uh, and one more thing is that uh, in this case uh, we are all uh, there is an implicit assumption that the uh, matrix elements are of order one. Uh, yes. Right. Yes. Yes. So, so can there be situations where the matrix elements uh, like close in a such a way that it cancels out the decreasing effect of the uh, coefficients? So it could be, but uh, I, I don't know any, any particular example. I mean, in the standard model is clear. Now the standard model has many specifics, uh, many non-natural specifics, 
and this is why we will discuss this later why why uh, why uh, in particular with the flavor structure um then you have yeah matrix elements uh, and then you can have like uh, suppression mechanisms of matrix elements like for example like uh, elicity suppressions things like this um however uh, when you when you go to dimension six, I think that the theory is gener general enough. Uh, so I think at this stage is now very difficult to really find uh, find uh, specific suppressions at dimension six that are lifted at dimension eight. Uh, I don't know of any example, um, right? In any case, um, what is the motivation? I mean, if you if you find the process that is uh, suppressed up to dimension six, uh, so that you have to start including contributions at dimension eight. You found a process that you don't want to <laughs> you don't want to study because <laughs> it's going to be very suppressed, and I'm not sure you're going to learn uh, very much. Uh, right now, we are trying to learn about the, the dimension six contributions, and and I think for for now that's good enough. Oh, thank you. So, so Javier, there was also a question in the chat I see. from Debasis, um, so saying that the dimension five operators can't discriminate between various models, but different high energy models can give different dimension six operators. Can we say that dimension six operators are more sensitive to BSM? Well, dimension five operators, uh, I mean, they can discriminate. You have 12 of them and they give different uh, different effects. Now, of course, if you if you ask about the richness of, of, of the of the of the corrections, of course, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the SMEFT at dimension six is much richer than the dimension five. Um, so uh, of course, there are many models that do not give any contribution to the dimension five operator. There are many models that uh, uh, do not break a lepton number and, and uh, they will not give any contribution. So, so the only hope is to look for effects at dimension six. So yeah, um, especially where you're doing flavor physics with quarks and things like this, uh, typically, the dimension five operator is irrelevant. So, so you are stuck at dimension six, which is not so bad. Um, okay, okay. Th th thanks, Javier. Is that okay, yeah. Debasis? Yes. Okay. Right. So let's let's talk about a bit more uh, about this meft. Um, and so let's let's start uh, let's start talking about how the, the fermion masses and the CK matrix is is is, uh, is realized within the SMEF. Um, so the relevant terms in the Lagrangian that will uh, lead to fermion mass terms uh, are, of course, like in the standard model, the the the, the Yukawas, But now there are additional contributions that contribute to things that, when I change the Higgs with the VEF, will give something that looks like masses. And these are these three operators uh, of this type. So this, this, uh, these three operators, which are called UH, DH, and EH, because uh, if you give VEFs to these three Higgses, you get, you get the, a, a, a V cube, and then you have a, a left-handed and a right-handed fermion. And, and at the end, you get something that is uh, indistinguishable from, from a mass term, OK? Um, I, I add here something, and I said this is not part of the tutorial. But uh, in case you you want to check it out, you can try to do it yourself. So you you take all these uh, operators that you find here, and you convince yourself that these three operators are the only ones that give rise to to these uh, mass terms after electroweak symmetry break. So in the standard in the SMEF, one can write a exactly the same kind of mass term that we wrote in the standard model. However, now the masses are not just this standard model piece, but uh, also contain these extra pieces which are proportional to the Wilson coefficients of these operators here. 
Okay, so this equation is very important because this equation tells you what is the relationship between the masses and the Yukawa couplings in the presence of these dimension six operators. Um, one can still do what we did before. One can still uh, work uh, in a basis where this is uh, diagonal and this is diagonal and this is not diagonal only because of the CKM matrix, okay? So this is uh, not modified, okay? So we can still write this, these masses. Um, but now, as I said, the Yukawa couplings and, and, and the masses are not related um, by, by, the same, by the same equation. Okay, one has an additional, an additional contribution. Okay, the CKM matrix is still a unitary matrix with the same uh, conditions and still parameterized by four real parameters. Okay, so three, uh, three angles on one face. And we can still use the Wolfenstein parameterization. Um, however, there is one important difference now is that in the standard model, you can get the, say you can relate directly the CKM elements to the couplings of the W with the, with the different quarks. Now this is not the case because now you have these extra uh, contributions uh, here, okay? Because these are the, 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 the operators that when you do this additional uh, rotation that breaks the Freibos symmetry, then uh, you get these extra non-diagonal terms uh, um, that couple to the, to the W, okay? So this is the way, uh, for example, in the SMEF, the W coupling is, is modified, okay? You have the standard model part, which is a, a CK matrix, but then you have a, a, a term which is proportional to this uh, to this Wilson coefficient of this operator, okay? Again, you have here an exercise in case you want to check it out, okay? Uh, let me give a, 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 an important but technical comment. Um, so if you look at this equation here, you have a V, okay, a V of the Higgs, and also here you have a V of the Higgs. One has to also acknowledge the fact that in the SMEF, one has this operator O8, OH, which is H, H, uh, H dagger H to the power of three. And this is going to modify the, uh, the, the minimization of the potential, okay? And modifying the minimization of the potential is going to modify ex the exact value of the, of the Higgs VEF, or more precisely, it's going to modify the way the VEF of the Higgs is related to, the, to this mu and lambda parameters in the standard model. Now there is an additional contribution from this operator and the particular expression at dimension six for the VEF for the VEF of the Higgs is, is this one. So it's the the, the standard model um, the standard model uh, VEF, okay, in terms of mu and lambda. But then one has a, an additional contribution, and the VEF that you find in all these expressions is the full VEF, uh, including dimension six operators. Uh, one also has uh, other modifications uh, in the SMEF. Uh, in the standard model, non-diagonal set couplings are zero, but now you have uh, contributions from, from, this, uh, from this type of operators. I can give you, these are called anomalous set couplings, for, okay? Uh, because they are couplings that do not appear in the standard model. Uh, just, just for you to, to see it more clearly. So these HQ operators, if you go to these tables, uh, you find them right here, these ones here, okay? Which are two fermions. Well, uh, actually all, uh, all of these ones, all, all these uh, are of this type. You have find two fermions and then you have two Higgs fields and the covariant derivative. And then when the, when the Higgs field, uh, so when you, you, you give a VEF to the, to, the, to the Higgs and then you pick up a gauge boson from this covariant derivative, and you get a bunch of things among which you get uh, these uh, anomalous W couplings and these anomalous Z couplings, okay? And so on. I mean, you can derive all the Feynman rules in the SMEF by yourself, it's not so complicated. And all this has many implications. One of them, more related to flavor, is the determination of the CKM parameters, okay? Typically, you determine the uh, Wolfenstein parameters by considering a bunch of uh, flavor processes, 
which depend in different ways on the elements of the CK matrix. And then since they only, you only have four parameters of the CK matrix, you can do a global fit and everything has to uh, agree. No? For example, in the, in, you fix two of them, A and Lambda, and then you plot everything else in this plane of rho and eta, which are the other ones. And this is what you, what you get. Uh, you have many, many different constraints, but they all should agree on one particular point. And so far they do. And this means that everything is consistent. But if you have new physics, then this is not guaranteed because uh, the new physics contributions to all these different modes are going to be in general different, okay? So um, you don't really know what you're extracting uh, if you have new physics uh, uh, coming into this decays, okay? And there are two typical situations. One is, what is called here the nightmare, which is that everything agrees perfectly well in a very, very tiny spot in this plane. And the other one is that nothing agrees. And this case here is only possible because new physics affects differently all the different extractions of this, of this uh, CKM parameter. Okay, we'll see an example in the, in the tutorial. The general case is discussed in this, in this paper where where one uh, considers the most general contributions in the SMEF to, to, to four of these, uh, of these uh, uh, constraints here, which by the way, none of which, yes. So these are two, uh, four of these, so delta MD, delta MS, uh, VUB here, and uh, the other one is the decay. Yeah, it's not here because the other one constrains the other uh, Wolfenstein parameter, which is neither this nor this. So. Uh, so we'll, we'll see that in the tutorial, but uh, essentially this paper, what it's doing is that considers these four, these four observables, includes all the possible contributions at dimension six, extracts the, 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 the Wolfenstein parameters, and then relates this to the, to the particular combination of SMEF parameters. Okay, so yes. Sorry, Javier, I have a, I have a question on this. Uh... In this uh, unitarity triangle fits. So mm -hmm. the fact that we have good agreement, what sort of limits or what, what, what scale does that set at the moment in terms of the SMESH theory? Because presumably that constrains right the, the scale to some degree, these measurements. Yes, so uh, yeah, so I, I don't have an answer for that, although I think it's a very interesting question and, and maybe someone could write a paper on that. So the um, of course, is is so as a general question, it's difficult to say. That, that that's that's the same question. Is that if you find something like this, what does it mean? I I don't know. You you have to do the exercise of 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 fitting together all the all the Wilson coefficients and so on. Now the fact that this is very consistent with each other, um, I think this is a rather complicated exercise. I think, I think. Um, 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 so let's see. One should take all these uh, all these processes and do a combined fit uh, to all the uh, Wolfenstein parameters and the SMEF parameters that contribute to all these parameters to all these observables. And then uh, one should find, since this is uh, consistent, one should find that uh, uh, all the extracted uh, confidence level regions for all these uh, SMEF parameters are compatible with zero. Uh, but then by looking at, the, at how large they can be, uh, you, can, you can relate it uh, to some effective new, new physics scale, right? So I think that, but I think the problem is that typically if you do that, you get, you get many, many more uh, Wilson coefficients than, than experimental inputs. And therefore you get many flat directions and you cannot conclude anything. That, that's what I would. Okay. Guess. So you would have to assume certain things didn't contribute and then set one at a time or whatever. You might say some were zero and then you could constrain one or other. I guess this is something the UT fit people might be considering or something. But anyway. Okay. I mean, all, all assumptions, I say, yes, it is difficult to, 
I mean, yes, but it's something interesting to to think. I mean, if you can if you can give me a good assumption that re, that reduces considerably the number of uh, uh, parameters in the SMEF, then I could I could uh, mm -hmm. I could do that exercise. Um, yeah, I mean, so far in the general case, I'm pretty sure that you can have uh, that you can have situations with non-zero coefficients, so very low scales, uh, which are tailored uh, so that the contributions to all these uh, modes are not zero, but they conspire so that the, the, the extraction is just a standard model like. And so I would say that the effective, so I would say that in the most general case right now, the answer is the effective scale is consistent with, with the electroweak scale, mm -hmm. so to say. OK, okay. thanks, Javier. All right, so now let's go to let's go to to low energy to low energies. Okay, um, I give some references here. So now we're doing uh, experiments uh, much low, uh, much below the electric scale. Uh, now you have the same situation in which you have uh, electric physics and uh, dim higher dimensional operators uh, up here at the electric scale, and you can integrate out all the electric scale particles, and they will appear uh, as higher dimensional operators in an effective theory, which is called sometimes the wet, sometimes the left, where all your operators are, are built from, from fields down here. So there will be no, no W, no Z, no Higgs, no top. You will only have like light quarks and leptons and things like this, and, and, and the gluons and the photons, of course, okay? Um, so that's the only thing you can use to build your theory, but you will have in general some higher dimensional operators. And these coefficients of these operators will come from, 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 this, uh, from integrating out these two parts of the, of the, SMEF, uh, of the SMEF Lagrangian. Um, an important thing to notice here is that the dimension four part of this uh, weak effective Lagrangian is just QCD and QED. Okay, I will say more about this later, but this is a very important thing. I guess it, well, I guess it uh, could, could, could be different, but that's what it is. And it has uh, very important implications. Uh, here I give you the same kind of example I gave you before. So if you have a, a, a flavor transition mediated by a W boson, if this, let's say that this corresponds to a decay of a charm particle, then the typical, so all the all the Mandelstam variables here are going to be of the order of, of a GeV because it's a, it's a, it, the energy available is just the, the, the charm mass. And then you have this, this propagator here from the W. T is of the order of the charm, which is much, much smaller than the mass of the W. Okay, so T is like some like one squared, while MW squared is like 80 squared. So there is a huge hierarchy. And then you can do the same thing. You can do an expansion of this propagator. And here you have this coefficient, which is going to be the, the Wilson coefficient. And then this is going to be uh, something that you can recreate with a, a four fermion operator of this type, okay? And here you have a Wilson coefficient, which is exactly the same as this because the Fermi constant is defined in this way, okay? So if you ever see something like this, now you know why. Uh, it's just the expansion of this of this propagator. Okay, in complete generality, this is the effective theory at low energies, QCD and QED plus a set of dimension uh, higher than four operators with some Wilson coefficients that now instead of C we call L for low energy and some operators uh, O of higher dimension. Okay, and some examples of dimension. Uh, five and six operators in this in this uh, in this low energy EFT. Uh, we have uh, dipole operators of dimension five, so two fermions uh, and one field strength uh, with a with a with a photon or with a gluon. Okay, so this lead to Feynman rules of this type. And uh, examples of dimension six, they're all uh, four fermion operators, um, and they and they look like. Like uh, like this, okay. 
So for example, you have new EDU, which is a charge current uh, mixed uh, uh, quark lepton operator, like the one we found here, okay? Uh, again, V left left means the, the same thing as uh, we had a question before. And then this is another example in which we have an ED, uh, uh, this is a neutral current operator where you have a, a two quarks uh, of the town type and two charged leptons, okay? So this would contribute to a decay of a B to a charm and tau and a neutrino. And this would contribute to a decay of a B to an S quark and muon, uh, mu plus, mu minus, okay? Um, now, how many operators do we have in this theory? Even larger than in the SNEF. We have Can I ask a question? Go ahead, go ahead. I think you are muted or something happened. Uh, oh, we can't oh. hear you, Kajri. Yeah, okay, now. Basically, sigma mu nu. Can you please tell me why do you use sigma mu? You want to know what it is or why I use sigma why? mu? Why? Why? Hmm. Yes. I, I mean, here, no? It's very simple. Uh, so uh, if you have, you need to have two gammas because, because this here is P right electron and this thing is P right electron, this one here. And so if you put only one gamma, this is zero because the P right, uh, you can anti-commute it and here it becomes a P left and P right times P left is zero. So if you have a gamma here, then this operator is just zero. So you need two gammas. Three gamma is also not allowed. And four gammas you can always express in terms of less gammas. Is that the question? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, all right. So you can look at this paper where all these left operators are, are given. Uh, in this case, we have a, a six dimension five operators uh, times flavor um, and 73 plus 16 dimension six operators plus flavor. You see that the, the, the numbers are even, even more crazy than for the Smith. Okay, um, important, important thing is we can, we can perform this matching here uh, once and for all. And this is model independent because we know this theory and we know this theory and then we can match. An example is given here. So the operator of this uh, B to U E neutrino operator uh, you can calculate it in terms of uh, standard model uh, couplings and uh, dimension six couplings. So at, this is at three level. Of course, you can try to do this exercise. It's not, it's not difficult, uh, but uh, you can always write things like this. So the left, if you start from the SMEF, the left is completely fixed and, and uh, it's just a matter of doing uh, more and more uh, uh, loops in the matching calculation, okay? I really recommend uh, that you do this exercise. It's not difficult and it's very instructive. Okay, so some important comments. QCD and QED is the low energy EFT of the standard model uh, EFT, okay? So at dimension four, that's the only thing you have. Uh, the cutoff is the electroweak scale. So from the point of view of the low energy EFT, the new physics, quote unquote, is the electroweak, uh, is the electroweak physics, okay? And the flavor group, the whole flavor group that we discussed uh, this, this morning, um, so this U3 to the five is an accidental symmetry of this EFT, okay? Because, because at dimension four, this is only QCD and QED, and QCD and QED respect this, uh, this, uh, this symmetry. I have one question. How is the number of operators increasing in the left? The symmetries are same. Uh, so shouldn't 
uh, the number of operators have decreased. Um, um, the, the, the point is that in the, the, the symmetry is, is not the same. Uh, the left has a, a smaller symmetry because uh, in the left, you don't have this, the full standard model gate symmetry anymore, okay? Uh, so in the, the, the left is a theory which has a gate symmetry, which is SU3 cross U1, while the SMEF is a theory with an SU3 cross U2 cross U1 symmetry. And this makes a, a big difference because now we can separate, uh, for example, charge, charge, left-handed charge leptons with neutrinos and things like this, okay? All right. Uh, so it's 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 uh, it's already time. Can I can I do this example, Jim, or should I finish already? You you started a few minutes late, Javier. So okay. uh, if okay. if you want to do this, there is one more uh, question that ah, there's another came question. In. When higher operators are added, how the renormalization of the theory is taken care of, particularly the higher operators. Um, well, uh, yeah, this this I think I, I already discussed. So so if you have a if you have a if you have an operator uh, which looks like like this, okay. So this uh, this type the gluonic dipole operator. So to, to give an example, um, then for example, you might wonder what happens with with this with this uh, uh, or let's let's do it, let's do it even better. So. Imagine we have a, a dimension, uh, so a four fermion operator, and then you say, okay, I can calculate an amplitude by doing something like this, okay, uh, fermion scattering, okay, with an insertion of this operator here, uh, and this is going to be divergent. You are going to need a, a you're going to need a, a, a counter term, but you have a a counter term from an operator that looks like this. And since you have all the possible operators in your effective theory of dimension six, then you do have this operator and you can add a counter term. So that's that's not a problem. Um, since you already have this operator, you can also do something like this. And this is also divergent. So what is the what is the um, uh, the the counter term that you need for this? Well, you have already the operator which is the gluonic operator, the dipole operator. So by including this counter term, you can renormalize the theory, okay? So the renormalization of this theory just works exactly as, uh, as in regular QFT. It's, it's, there is no difference. Okay. All right, so let me finish by doing this example of mu and decay, um, because this is a proxy for all the other things that we can. Uh, tomorrow, okay? Um, so the mu is stable under QCD plus QED, okay? So if there was only QCD and QED, the mu wouldn't, wouldn't decay. You need to, you need to, 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 do a, to, to, to do an electroweak transition in order to, to for mu uh, for mu to decay. Uh, so if I write the low energy effective theory up to the operators of dimension four, then the muon is stable, okay? That means that this is like proton decay. If I look for the decay of the muon, I'm probing directly the dimension six operators in the low energy effective theory. In particular, I'm probing this dimension six operator here, okay? And this operator can indeed uh, mediate muon decay. But uh, then I can use the, the, the lifetime of the muon to measure this uh, Wilson coefficient of this dimension six operator. Uh, you can work it out yourself, it's not difficult. This is the expression for the decay rate of the, of the muon at three level, okay? Um, experimentally, we see that the, the, the so this, the rate is 10 to the, 19 GV with a, with a three, okay? And then comparing this thing with this thing, uh, we learn that this coefficient here 
assuming C is one, and this is related to Jim's question, assuming that C is one, then this lambda here is 172 GeV. This is what you get just by comparing this with this. Okay, and it turns out that 172 GV is 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 is, is the VEF of the Higgs. So 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 the scale is the electroweak scale. You see, we by looking at the muon decay. Okay, and assuming that there is no nothing funny going on with this with this coefficient here, we determine that the scale. By the way, this is a this is a, an error. Let me. There is a square here. Okay because it I mentioned five operator. Okay. Uh, so by, by, by doing this exercise, we measure the electroweak scale. Um, we discovered the electroweak scale. So if we didn't know about it, which was the case many years ago, we look at, uh, we, we, we only think there is only QCD and QED. And then we are looking for a dimension six effects and we're looking for the scale of new physics. And we, that, and we, 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 we measure the, the muon decay and we determine that the, the, the scale of new physics is 170 GeV, which is true. That's the electroweak scale. Okay. Uh, of course, if you know the model, you can write the, the, the diagram with a W, and you find that C over lambda squared is nothing but, but this. And, and you can write it either like this or in terms of GF. And in fact, this is in practice what is used to determine the VEF of the, of the Higgs or, or, the, or, the, or the Fermi constant. You can also do this exercise and you find this, uh, these very precise values because the, 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 tau, uh, the muon lifetime is, is very precisely measured, okay? But again, uh, this is modified if there is new physics, okay? And you can, uh, and you can write something like this. Uh, the value as before, and some correction that would come if there is some new physics. And in terms of uh, uh, SMEFT operators, uh, you can check that this delta is given by a three level by this, by this expression in terms of these four Wilson coefficients. This is also an exercise you should do. It's simple and it's very instructive. And I will, I will stop here. And tomorrow I will finish this... Uh, this section and start talking about the uh, about uh, weak decays and and flavor physics. Um, is there any question? I don't see anything in the chat. So there is one the, now. Yeah. So they're, they're asking about C and. Yes, um, YC will be a further one. Uh, okay, so let me answer this uh, right here. So um, as you see in, in, in this particular example, um, um, if you associate this, uh, this new physics scale uh, with the mass of the W, which is in this particular case, the, the particle that mediates the transition, okay? Then, uh, then C is not one, it's, it's, it's a coupling square. And this is very typical, typical because you have a, you have a mediator, but then it, they have some couplings and if this is weakly coupled, you get this, this, this G square, okay? So yes, you would say, okay, the, the, the scale is not 170, the scale is 80 GV, but the, then the coefficient is not one, but this is, is G square, okay? I, I think, uh, so that, that would be a legitimate thing to say. Um, now, I, I, I can ask you, uh, what do you think? Do you think the scale, the electroweak scale is fixed by MW? Or do you think the electroweak scale is fixed by, by the VEV of the Higgs? Okay, because the difference between one thing and the other is G squared. Okay, so... This is a, a question which is not uh, completely well defined. I know that C is of order one in the sense that these couplings are of order one in the sense that the difference between V and MW is uh, it's, 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 it's nothing, okay? Uh, okay, there is a factor of two of 
for or, or whatever, but this is this is not uh, really, really important, okay? And we're not going to do precision physics with these ideas. Uh, this is just to understand the concept, no? Uh, later on, if we, if, we, if we want to know exactly where is the new physics scale, at the end, we have to discover some particle and then, and then that's it. But there's always a discussion, okay? Some effect points towards uh, a scale of, of two TV or four TV, but you know that depends on the coupling, instead of four, could be 14. And this makes a big difference in, the, in practice because maybe you can detect a 4 TV particle, but you cannot detect a, a 14 TV particle, okay? Uh, so then you have to start uh, worrying about the couplings and so on. But uh, for an order of magnitude uh, understanding of the situation, this is typically not, not very important. And this is why, for now, I'm always assuming that these Cs are a further one. Uh, I had a question. Uh, 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 it might be uh, very stupid, but uh, can, uh, if you con uh, consider like beta functions, uh, of these operators for these operators, can that shed some light uh, on this pro problem? So, can that differentiate between the C and the lambda? Well, um, uh, you can uh, um, no. Uh, so, I mean, so let's see. Um, first of all, the difference between C and lambda is uh, something I invented. Uh, today, because I mean, of course, uh, I'm not the first one using this notation, but uh, this is an invention. I I could just I could just talk about C. Okay, so uh, when I when I talk about effective theory here, I have this L, and this L is just the ratio, and the theory only knows about this L. It doesn't know about the lambda. It doesn't know about the C. It only knows about about this, but this has a, a mass dimension. This is this is has mass dimension one over m squared. Okay, um, so so it is associated with some with some mass scale necessarily. Okay, um, so so uh, so it's it's going to be large or small depending on whether. The, the, the physics that is generating this, this, uh, this coefficient is, is a physics that appear at very high energy or, the, or, a, or at a lower energy. And this, is, and this is going to be the most important thing. The beta functions uh, only depend on the effective theory. Okay, the, the beta function is something you can calculate in the effective theory. And since the effective theory doesn't know anything about the scale, it only knows about the combination between possible couplings and possible scales, then the beta function cannot tell you anything about that. Okay. Oh, okay, thanks. This is very important. The beta functions can be calculated in the effective theory alone with no regard to any model. Of course, they can also be calculated in, in, in the model, but just because the model has the same infrared structure as the, as the, as the effective theory. But the beta functions are a, an object of the effective theory. And the effective theory doesn't know anything about, about the, the couplings and, and particles of the, of the, uh, of the UV. OK. So. I don't see any other questions for now, um, but you'll have lots of opportunities tomorrow to uh, ask questions to Javier. There's two lectures tomorrow as well as the tutorial. Uh, so, um, so, so thank you, Javier. I, I, I did receive the tutorial problems. I haven't received the lecture notes. Okay, I will send them now. So, by the way, I don't know if the students have my email, but. Uh... Uh, but they can also send me emails. Uh, ah. I will I will take questions if, if they if they want to send me an email with some question that I can answer tomorrow. 
uh, that that would also work. I don't know if they if they have my I, I, my email. I can also write it here, and then are you going to are you going to uh, put these lectures uh, online somewhere? Yeah. So if if you make a PDF of these notes, yeah, if you just put your email underneath yeah, the title, right. that would that would work perfectly. Okay, I just put it there, and then I send you this this lecture notes. All right. So yeah, th thanks a lot, Javier.